again at this concept of of the the idea anyway that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins and examining whether or not that is actually a true statement and and trying uh, to do my best as it were um, to put us on the right path the right mental, emotional, spiritual trajectory so that we can understand this concept with clearness so that we arrive at the proper destination. That's the goal. The goal is to, we've got everybody on the, sh- on the boat. We're going from the uh, amphibious assault cr- ship and we're landing, we're landing the marine, the marine uh, raider team on the beach. But battalion, okay, battalion on the beach. Roger that. Roger that. I'm thinking too small because I was a small boat. But <laughs> it'll be bigger boats. But we have a target. We want to land on the beach. Okay, we got an enemy on the beach. We're going to assault. It'd be bad if our battalion hit the wrong beach. That'd be bad, right? Not good. And if you've ever done this, if you've ever been on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a boat or a craft on the open ocean, there's nothing before you. It's not like you can see Honolulu out there or something. You see nothing. Uh, I can tell you from experience, there's only one way to make sure you hit that beach, and that's by staring at that compass and making sure you stay on point. There's no sense in looking up because there's nothing to hit. <laughs> Just look down. And so we're doing just that. We're looking down, and this, this topic is complicated because it, on the one hand, we are saved, our sins are forgiven by the shedding of blood, and on the other hand, the statement, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, is false. And understandably, to a lot of people, that sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. And I'm going to do my best with God's help to explain why it's not and, and what I'm ultimately trying to av- avoid. So I'm all about full disclosure in my teachings. What is my, pro- what is my underlying, what is my mission? <laughs> what is my goal? What am I trying to accomplish? I'm going to tell you what I'm trying to accomplish here in just a second. Before we do that, though, let's say our blessing and get right to our teaching because I have a lot to share. Blessed are you tonight, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. Please, Adonai, our God, sweeten the words of your Torah in our mouth and in the mouth of your people, the house of Israel. May we and our offspring and the offspring of your people, the house of Israel, all of us know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you Adonai, who teaches Torah to his people, Israel. Amen. You know, it's interesting because Daniel was reading from the Besorah just now, and he's talking about the talents and so forth. And it just so happened as in my, this, this Bible I've had for going on 30 years. Now, I bought this Bible in 1995, the year that Rebetzin and I married. And uh, I've kept it all these years because it's chock full of... Um, of notes and stuff I've stuck in there and written in the margins. And so it becomes my kind of my collective journal of nearly 30 years. But in there, in there, I have a note from Rabbi Tversky's commentary where he basically shares an insight from the Hafez Haim. The Hafez Haim gives a parable related to Psalm 24, verses 3 through 4, where it says, Who shall ascend the mountain of God? one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not borne his soul in vain. And the Hafez Haim gives a parable to that to explain what that passage is talking about. And then basically he uses the talents parable. He says, a man once gave a a broker a sum of money to invest for him, and after a long period of time, had elapsed, he inquired of the broker how his money had been doing, and the broker opened his safe and proudly showed the man that not one of his dollars had, had been taken, that they're all left intact. Not a single bill had been touched. 
And the man said, you fool, I gave you the money so that you would invest it and give, there would be a, 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 a multiplication. I didn't give it to you just to hold on to it and do nothing with it. Who shall deserve to, do, to dwell on the mountain of God, the Havitz Haim ask? He who has not born the divine soul in vain. That is, when we ultimately return to our souls to God, we should be able to show what positive achievements we've accomplished with it. Other, otherwise, it will be a soul born in vain. And before that, he says that he talks about Rabbi Torsky says, re- resisting temptation is good, but that's not what we're called here to do. We're not called here to resist temptation. We're called here to do good deeds. We're called here to do good works. And that is precisely the, the line of thinking, this not doing works, not meriting anything. That is precisely the line of thinking I am combating. Some would say that I'm combative against Paul the Apostle. And to a certain degree, that's very true because I, he is a, a false apostle. He's a heretic. But that's not really the point. My target is not really Paul. My target is what Paul taught, and more importantly, what it prevented people from doing. What it prevented people from doing was entering into the covenant and living a covenantal life as God had intended to. Kept them from following the Torah, and that's the point. So this discussion today, and by the way, the title of the message is, you've heard it said, without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. That's the title today. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. You've heard this said, and, the, and I'm going to demonstrate to you that it's not true and explain why it's not true, but yet it's true in another sense, okay? It's very important, and it's very important that we get this right because just like when you're following a compass to a destination point, it's very exact. I had to go to school for that. Now, I went to school for that a long time ago, and I, if you asked me to tell you how I did it back then, I couldn't, I'd have to have a refresher course because, I, frankly, I don't remember, okay? Um, but all I remember is it was very exact. You have to use the little things you're doing that. I mean, you're, all that kind of stuff. It was very complex, you know, to make sure you get to the right point. And so this is, can be complex, but here's the reason that I want to tell you this. And I want to illustrate this by a question that was asked this week, which is a very good question, a very reasonable question, a very common question, and it illustrates the problem. Okay? The question that this person asked was, well, if you can get forgiveness in the Torah, then why do we need the Messiah? It's a good question. It's an understandable question, particularly when you understand that there was a dichotomy created falsely and a non-biblical mindset that the law was somehow opposite of grace, that you could either have either or. You either had forgiveness of your sins by a vicarious atonement or you had to do works of the law, but those two things don't work together. And it's this mindset of, wait a minute, the person asked this question, and I understand it, and it's a good question. If we can get forgiveness in the Torah, then why do we need the Messiah? And that goes back to Paul, who taught that the point of the Torah was to grant us universal atonement, and it could not be achieved because, you know, nobody can do the Torah perfectly which we've covered that. That was all a lie, too. You don't have to do Torah perfectly. And therefore, we need JC. All right. So what's Rabbi Griffin's answer to that, based on Scripture, based on Jewish literature, based on all this? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Put up our graph, please, if you would, Keturim. Um, because I want to begin with this graph, I think, and just to, it's very simplistic, uh, and this will kind of illustrate the point here, hopefully, of what I'm trying to say. That's a great, that's a beautiful graph, actually, but that's not the one that I was looking for. But that's okay. Is it there? There we go. There is our graph. Okay, praise God. Very, very simplistic graft. Y'all will see this on the screen online in just a second. So here in this graft, we have 
the illustration to the far right of the screen, my far right, if I, here is the Passover. Represents, that's the left of the screen as you're looking at it. Redemption. This is the sequence of events, okay? So we left Egypt because of the blood of the lamb. We had redemption. We went from there and we crossed the Red Sea. And that's considered a universal mikvah, universal immersion in water. And the mikvah is all about purification, transformation, being completely born again. Complete. It's, it's about renewal. It's about new birth. This is where born again, new creation, new birth comes from. It actually comes from the mikvah. Okay? So just like in Halakha, traditionally, now there are, there are instances where you can get one before the other, but that's only in cases where... I don't, that's too complicated, but there's, there's, there's exceptions to the rule. But the general rule is, in Halakha, you have to get circumcised first. And in the temple time, you would offer an offering after the fact. But you would get circumcised first. Once you're healed from your circumcision, you would go through the waters of the mikvah. Okay? And then after the waters of the mikvah, you would bring an offering to the temple, kind of like a thanks offering and so forth, to the temple, okay? And this follows the pattern that all of that, you say, well, where did, where did the rabbis get this order of conversion from? How is it that somebody can become a Jew who wasn't a Jew? And no, being Jewish is not limited to physical descent, never has been. The first Jew, Abraham, was not physically Jewish. And so the idea is where did they get this from? They got it from the Exodus, that's where it comes from, okay, that we had to get circumcised, and then we went through the waters of immersion, and the waters of immersion is where we got born again, and then we went to Mount Sinai and lifted up an offering, okay? And in the, in the case of Mount Sinai, our main offering was we will do and we will hear, meaning that when God said, will you accept this covenant? Before we even knew what it was, we said, we will do it and we'll hear it, meaning that we're going we're gonna to accept it sight unseen, okay? All right? So this, when we talk about redemption from sin, blood that atones for sin, we're talking here primarily, as I've said several different times, the offering of Yeshua happened on a very macro level, okay? Yeshua did not die for your personal sin, okay? He did not die. I'm going to pick on Yaakov. Yaakov, he did not die for those dry markers you stole when you were 15. I, I got the report. I, they wanted me to know in case you were... A problem. We just watch our dry eraser, watch our dry markers from now on. But, you know. But in all seriousness, he didn't die for your personal sin, Shane, or your personal sin, Mariyahu. He didn't die for your personal sin, Shoshana. He didn't die for that. He died for the, for the problem of Adam. That we all fall under that category because we're human beings. There's also something else he had to rectify in addition to Adam that most people don't know about, and that is the whole issue with the sapphire tablets that were broken. See, that was a big problem too because we follow this program, right? We offer up the redemption. As I taught this week about the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb was not an individual offering, although you had to eat of it individually. And see, that's the exchange. The offering for the Pesach was brought for the whole family unit. And by the way, you had to register for it. Did you know that in antiquity? You had to actually register for it with your family. You, and I, you, you actually had to, in some way, say, I'm registered to vote. I'm registered to eat. You had to actually make a way. You had to let everybody know, I'm in this. I'm anti, I am ante up on this, okay? So, so that that one offering that was being offered for the whole family would apply to you as well. But you didn't bring it individually. 
In fact, the head of the house, the head of the family, brought the offering to the temple on your behalf. Okay? And so, it was a, in other words, it was very much a corporate offering, but you, you and I had to eat of that offering specifically. So you could say, well, uh, granddad, you know, on behalf of the whole family, the pat- whoever the patriarch of our family is, we have a family of 30, or, or I don't, you know, maybe that was too big for one lamb, but actually it was, and I'll explain that in just a second. Why you say, well, one, how could one lamb feed 30 people? I'm, I'm, that's, I'm glad you asked that. Let me come back and tell you that in a second. Because it, it actually would be potentially fine for that big a family, maybe. But my wife is like, just go on, move on, quit, quit talking to yourself. So I talk to myself all the time while I'm up here. The doctor says I'm getting better. But you didn't have to eat of it individually. You couldn't skip that part. This is why Yeshua said, you have to drink my blood and eat my flesh. What was he talking about? That puts a lot of Jewish people at, uh, makes, them, makes us uneasy. Why? Because drinking blood and eating human flesh is like the worst of the worst. Totally not kosher. What was Yeshua referring? And by the way, here you have Yeshua. Can you imagine the anointing that Yeshua must have had when he was teaching, when he was giving a drosh? Can you imagine? He is the living Torah. He doesn't have to look it up like I do. It's him. But guess what? He taught this lesson and everybody left. They left the shul that day. Wrote negative things on the, <laughs> sent out spam emails about how he's a nutcase. And he turned to Kepha and he said to Kepha, my favorite line in the whole Basara, this line defines me. It does. It always has. And this is personal. I'm talking about personally me, my personal feeling. Yeshua sees everybody walk away when he gives this teaching because they misunderstand what he's saying. And he turns to Kepha and he says, will you also leave me? And Kepha looks around and says, where else will we go, Lord? Only you have the word of truth. That's my answer. You say, well, everybody's, what if everybody leaves? Like, well, I'm, I'm not leaving because I know how I got here. I got here because of Yeshua. So, but why did he say that? Why did he say, drink my blood and eat my flesh? And he's talking about the Pesach Seder. Why? Did you know, I know you know this because you're here because I've told you, but some of you out there, um, did you know that it is a halakhic requirement to have red wine at the kosher, I mean, at the Pesach Seder? And the reason is you can't have white. Yosef, you can't have blush. Sorry. I'm, I know. And the problem is it's hard for Yosef because you have to understand, Barack and Yosef, they're used to having blush champagne every single day. That's how they roll. It's a kosher Don Perignon. <laughs> Just that's how they roll, man. So that's... So we have to pre- that's why we have to prep to have them over for Arab. It's like, save up. <laughs> but seriously, no, you have to have red wine at the, at the Seder. You cannot have anything other than red. And the reason the sages say you have to have red is because it is symbolic of the blood of the lamb. It says it in the halacha. And therefore, when you take the cups on the Seder, which is all four cups, it's part of the ceremony. It's not an option. I mean, you can use grape juice too. Don't get me wrong. If you if, if can't, can't do alcohol or don't want to do alcohol, you could do grape juice. But the point is, it has to be red. So therefore, when you take those four cups, you are literally drinking the blood of the lamb. That's the whole point. Which, by the way, the four cups come from Pharisaical Jewish tradition 
known as the oral Torah. Therefore, since Yeshua confirmed it, he condoned it because he was a Pharisee. Now, in the temple times, you literally had to eat of the Pesach Seder. No, excuse me. I'm sorry. The Pesach lamb. The Corbin Pesach. You had to eat of that. So, therefore, when he says, drink my blood and eat my flesh, he's not talking about him. He wasn't a cannibal. He's talking about the Passover lamb. He, and that's why he said, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Why? Because I'm that. Understand that I'm the Pesach lamb, just like I was the ram that replaced Isaac. And the sages say the ram that replaced Isaac was a ram that was created 2,000 years before creation, which means from eternity. It was a supernatural lamb. Who do you think, the ram, who do you think that was? Yeshua. So he's saying, this mystery I'm revealing to you is I'm the Pesach lamb, and that's how you get into the covenant. Do, do, are our sins forgiven? Yes, but it's not individual. It's macro. Okay? Now, incidentally, today, a question was asked, and I want to answer it here. I didn't answer it yesterday because partially I didn't have time, but I, it was a good opportunity to answer it today. And that is, if somebody is not circumcised, could they eat of the Corbin Pesach? And the answer is no. Therefore, this whole thing of, oh, I'm spiritually circumcised, uh, not going to work when we have a third temple. You can't even get in. That's a problem. But what about now? So we invite people, we invite the whosoever is to come to Pesach, which is a Seder. Can an uncircumcised person come and partake of the Seder? The answer is yes. Why? because we don't have a Corbin Pesach at the Seder. Spiritually, however, and this doesn't preclude the, the, the person who's not yet a Jew from participating, but it's just something I want to point out. The sages say, this is in every kosher Haggadah, the sages say, we don't have the Corbin Pesach at the Seder. However, we do get to eat of the lamb. Why? How? Because the afikomen, which is the matzah that we eat, is the very last thing, that represents the lamb of the Pesach. Therefore, when Yeshua said, take this bread and eat, he was taking of the afikomen at that time. They had already had the lamb, though. By that time, you would have already had the lamb, but they took the afikomen. The afikomen is a word that means that which comes after, alluding to the second coming of the Mashiach. He says, take this bread and, and eat because this is my body broken for you. He, spiritually, he's talking. So today, even in, an orthodox, in every Orthodox Seder on Pesach, when we take the final thing we eat, you can't eat anything else after this. The final thing that you eat is that piece of afikomen, and that afikomen, the sages say today, represents the Korban Pesach, which is Yeshua. Now, I want to go back to something right quick before I forget. I said that one Pesach lamb may possibly take care of, let's say, 30 people. May, may, may not. Depends on the size of the lamb. Here in Texas, we have big lambs. <laughs> but here's something you may not know. On Pesach, there were actually two lambs. There was the Pesach for, the, excuse me, there was the, the lamb the festival lamb, okay, the Pesach Hagiga, which is the festival lamb, and that was the lamb you had for dinner. That's the main course lamb. Because the halakha is you have to be completely full. You have to be completely full of the Hagiga lamb, before you partake of the, of the Corbin Pesach, the Corbin Pesach was the second lamb. And that lamb you had to eat in order to be part of the covenant. You don't eat that lamb. Even the Halakha says today you're not part of the covenant. And that lamb you had to eat at least an olive size. 
That's why the Afi Coleman can be just a small piece. But halakhically, it has to be about the size of an olive. So you have this piece of lamb that you eat. So why is, why is this so significant? For many reasons. One is there's two lambs, there's two Mashiachs. There's the Messiah who comes and suffers and dies, the Hagiga lamb, and then there's the one who comes and brings final redemption, and that's the Korban HaPesach. That is Yeshua. Yeshua is the one who came and suffered, and he comes again to be the king. He came first as the suffering Messiah, known as the Messiah, son of Joseph. He comes later as the suffering Messiah, Messiah, son of David. It also represents the two lambs, the two Akidot. That is, Isaac was offered first, and then later Yeshua was offered. So there's, there's significance to the fact that there's two that are being offered here. But going back to our graph, um, redemption, when, when we were in Egypt and we had the lamb, we came out of Egypt, we because of the blood of the lamb. So the blood of the Passover lamb is about redemption and liberty. Redemption and liberty. We are freed from bondage of the Satan, ultimately, and we're brought into the liberty of being in the people of God. We went from that point of liberty to the Red Sea, and it's at the Red Sea where we became born again. Our enemy, the, the Egyptian army, was completely swallowed up. And when the Egyptian, do you understand, when the Egyptian army was swallowed up, we were truly free. We were no longer slaves for sure because our master had just been killed. So now we were truly born again, okay? Now the next step on the journey after so put that graph book on the screen. Oh, it's on the screen there. So make sure it's on there for the people that are watching. We have the redemption. We go from the redemption. We go to the mikvah. We have, we're born again. What happens when we come out of the mikvah? The next stop is Mount Sinai where we receive the Torah of Hashem. You have to get this right. Now the Torah of Hashem comes after we've been redeemed, after we've been born again and our sins wiped away, then we get the law. Paul had it in the exact opposite. Paul took us from the covenant and back into bondage where there's no law because without law, there's bondage. He took us in the exact opposite direction. Now, everybody says the next question. So, the question that I wanted to, to, to properly answer was, why do we need the Mashiach? We need the Mashiach because ultimately it's only he who can get us out of the spiritual bondage. Now, let's go back to the broken tablets. Moses gets these tablets from, from Shemayim. They're divine. They're supernatural. They're carved literally out of the throne of heaven. He, he, he goes to heaven to get them, you understand. He wasn't on a mountain. He actually went into heaven. He comes down from the mountain with these divine tablets. And before they even come to us, we're sitting with a golden calf. Now, how can we do that? All of this just happened. How can we be sitting with a golden calf? But this is all intended to bring us to a deep level of tshuva, of repentance. Now, Moses has those tablets we don't have the Torah yet. So I did a message on this already. The whole thing of the, when the law came, people died. That's all a lie. That's not true. Okay. Moses, he's got these tablets, right? He's coming down. And he sees the people are sinning. What's he going to do? If I give them the covenant, now they're bound to die because now they'll be under the, 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 the authority of a wife, and a wife who's committed adultery has to be killed. So what's he do? He throws the tablets down, tablets down they shatter to pieces. 
You understand these are from heaven. The sapphire tablets from Shemayim. He broke them because in breaking the ketubah, now Israel is no longer a wife and no longer subject to the laws of a wife. That's fine because it saved her from immediate death. But it's a problem because she's also not in covenant anymore. She's just, she's like in a state of limbo. The whole nation, by the way, it applied to the whole nation. Even though allegedly there was a small group that started all up, doesn't matter. Everybody was guilty. That's why Moshe went back to heaven and said, God, please don't kill them. Why did he say, please don't kill them? You've already destroyed the Torah, so now they're not my wife. Now I don't have to kill them. Yes, but they're not in covenant. And therefore, they're outside your protection. So God says, all right, all right, all right. I will renew the covenant with them. And he told Moses to go carve out stone from the mountain. And he would write on those tablets the exact same Torah that was on the first ones. But it was no longer sapphire from the throne of God. It was rock from earth. Same so, same content, different substance. To the extent now that the, the rabbis say, we will never get the sapphire tablets back and therefore rise back up to that elevated place until the Mashiach comes. It's written right there in your Chumash to chapter 34 of the book of Exodus. That's the first entry in your Chumash. And so, therefore, Yeshua had to come not just to undo the sin of Adam, but he had to come to restore those broken tablets again. And so, we, this is why, on the one hand, we are saved by the blood of Yeshua, and we do get forgiveness of sins, but it's corporate. It's not individual. You say, okay, 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 I'm, I'm tracking with you, Rabbi, so... So what about, what about the next question that's usually asked of Jews, and that is, since you have no temple today, how can you have forgiveness of sins? Because to the Christian mind, this, this overarching redemption has to do with personal sin, and that's not true. You see, please put that graph back up. Oh, there it is again. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Leave it up. So the temple offerings, the sacrifices given to us in the Holy Torah, they only apply within the covenant of Torah. Okay? If you're not, if you're not inside the covenant of Sinai, then those sacrifices in the temple don't, don't apply to you. Now, there are instances where goyim could come and, and provide a sacrifice and the Jews would offer it on behalf of the goy and so forth. There are instances of that, but, but that's, those are special circumstances and so on and so forth. And, and really, frankly, just to be quite honest, the whole point of that is to hopefully the goy would become a Jew. But really and truly, if you want to bring a thank offering or a guilt offering or a sin offering or anything like that, peace offering, you have to be Jewish. You have to be in the covenant. You understand what I'm saying? The way to get into the covenant, however, is through the Pesach lamb. You have to come into the covenant just like we came into the covenant. So to say that, well, how do you get your sins forgiven if there's no temple? I don't have to worry about that because I'm in the covenant already. And we'll come to the scriptures in just a second about this specifically. But I was always bothered by the fact that when you look at the Torah, I noticed that, because I'm trying to reconcile this in my mind years ago, and I've always been taught that Yeshua is our sin offering. Yeshua is our sin offering. He's not. Not exactly. I mean, he is, which I'll come to that in a second. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that when you look at the offerings of the Torah, the, the, the temple offerings, there is no offering that you could bring for intentional sin. All the offerings are offerings of mistakes. 
unintentional, oopses, oversights. Isn't that intriguing? And yet all of us would say, when we came to the Lord, before we came to the Lord, we were rebels. We had sinned intentionally or, or had intentionally. It wasn't accidental. And therefore, I'm asking God to forgive me my sin that I did on purpose. I want to stop being a rebel and become a friend of God. Okay, that's great. And, and what's interesting is, stay with me on this, though that mindset had nothing to do with the temple. The temple was only valid if you did an accident, an unintentional sin. In fact, Isaiah chapter 1, this is why God says, I hate your offerings and your new moon sacrifices. Why? Because we were bringing those sacrifices, but we were doing it in rote form. We were intentionally idolaters, but we were doing this thinking that God would give us a pass. God says those sacrifices don't make up for intentional rebellion. So why is, in, 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 in the covenant, why is it that in the covenant, there's no sin offering I can bring to the temple for an intentional sin? And the answer is because I'm in the covenant. Meaning that because I've, I'm in the covenant intentionally, it means I'm not a rebel. Therefore, God reckons that any sin I commit in that covenant is reckoned as unintentional because I'm not rebellious against God. I want to be married to God. This is why in a marriage, when a, a couple is married and they're intentionally married, they want to be married, if there is a sin against one partner and, you know, you, you're supposed to take out the trash and you didn't or something like that, you know, I missed your birthday, it's considered accidental. It's not considered intentional. And therefore, there's a reconciliation for that type of thing. And so here in the covenant is the same thing. We came into the covenant and as a result of coming into the covenant, we're no longer rebels. And as a result, there is remedies within the covenant to solve failure. Teshuva. Now, Yeshua is ultimately all of the sacrifices. Because even in Judaism today, all the sacrifices, no matter what they are, blood or not blood, they say in Judaism they all point to the Akedah. What's the Akedah? The Akedah they're talking about is Isaac, of course, who was the image of the Father, literally, offered on the altar for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask God on Yom Kippur to please forgive us by remembering Isaac. The Mekilta, which is the oldest Midrash, actually says another interpretation, and when he sees the blood... He sees the blood of the sacrifice of Isaac, as it says, and Abraham called the name of that place Adonai Yireh. The Lord will see in Genesis twenty-two fourteen, 14. And it is written, and he was about to destroy. The Lord beheld and repented in 1 Chronicles two fifteen. What did he behold? He beheld the blood of the sacrifice of Isaac, as it says, God will himself see the lamb for the burnt offering. So it's saying here in ancient Jewish literature, the Mekilta is a very old midrash going back long time ago. And it's saying here, when God sees the blood of the lamb, he sees the blood of Isaac. Every offering points to Isaac. Therefore, Yeshua is the final Akedah. There won't be another. And every offering we offer ultimately points to Yeshua. That's why in the covenant, we're actually in a renewal process. If we make a, 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 an issue of forgiveness, we need an issue of forgiveness. We don't have to go back to the Passover. We're in the covenant. So, so how do Jews, how do you get forgiveness today if you don't have a temple? Be, because of the Pesach lamb. You say, well, you don't believe, they don't believe in Yeshua. No, but they believe in the Messiah. Am I trying to say they don't need to believe in Yeshua? No, I'm not. They do. Our brothers do. But what I'm trying to say is you can't fault them for not believing in J.C., because if I'm talking to a Jew and some Christian is trying to evangelize them, I'm going to step in and tell the Jew, don't believe this mess. I can tell you about Yeshua, but what they're telling you is not the truth. 
So you can't say, well, because they denied JC, they're 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 no, you know, they're out of it. No, 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 that's not true. Because to accept JC, they would have to necessarily deny the Torah. That's not going to work. Okay, so I always get to this point where I have too much information Um, because I have a whole bunch of midrash I wanted to share with you as well on this topic, but maybe I'll save that for another time. But let me look at the verses now. Let's go to first first Kings. First of all, before we do that, let's go to let's go to our our one of the most famous verses of all time. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Now this is the inauguration of the temple. And Second Chronicles chapter 7, it's, it's talking about all the offerings and all the prayers and things that Solomon had offered up for seven full days, actually for 14 days, when he was dedicating his temple, which was magnificent. And verse 11, I'm going to, read, I'm going to be reading from verse 11 through verse 22. It says, when Solomon had finished the temple of Hashem and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all that he had in mind to do, the, to do in the temple of Hashem and in his own palace, Hashem appeared to him at night and said, now I want to point out this is God speaking now. He said, I've heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. Okay? Now, when I shut up the heaven so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Yeah. There's nothing there about needing to offer blood for forgiveness. This is talking about, see, we're already in the covenant. Passover has already passed over. We've already gone through the water. We're now in the covenant. And God is saying when you're in the covenant, If you will just humble yourself and pray and seek my face. What does it mean to seek the face? And to the Jew, when you tell a Jew, seek the face of God, that's called returning to Torah. When you do that, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal you and the land. It's all about the land of of Mitzrayim. Excuse me, the land of Egypt, rather. I mean, I'm sorry, the land of Israel, excuse me. So you see here, God is telling us the remedy for those in the covenant is teshuvah. Now, if you're not in the covenant, this doesn't apply to you. If you're not in the covenant, you're, you, you still got to get the lamb. And the lamb's got to take you to Sinai. And if the lamb doesn't take you to Sinai, you've, you, you're, you're on the wrong beach. Because he, God told Moses at the burning bush, which was at Mount Sinai, Go get them and bring them back here, and this will be the sign that I sent you that you will bring them back here. Therefore, if if Yeshua has not brought you to Sinai, then he's the wrong Yeshua, and God didn't send him because God told Moses, and Yeshua has to be like Moses, God told Moses, the sign that I sent you is that you'll bring them here. If they don't bring you, if if, if, if redemption doesn't lead you to Torah, then God hasn't redeemed you. That's the destination. So it says, it goes on to say in verse 15, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name will be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, 
Notice, by the way, notice what he says. This is God speaking, by the way. He says, my name will be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. I'm, when you talk to people who have been brought up, and I'm, I'm sorry, it's just, I just have to be blunt. They're brought up in Christianity. They almost speak with glee at the destruction of the temple. I heard somebody, I didn't hear, I read online, somebody was talking to a Jewish person on a chat I was looking at, and they said, see, God took your temple from you. I was like, man. But yet God, see, it's almost like, it's like joy that the temple is gone. And yet, and notice, Paul talked about the temple being destroyed or no longer, not destroyed, he talked about no longer being relevant, when it still stood. That's, you understand, he died about 10 years or so before the temple was destroyed. So that's pretty sadistic because you're talking about God's holy house and you're like, it, it's meaningless anymore. We no longer need it anymore. What? No one, you, you say, well, I wonder why the Jews rejected Paul. Are you kidding me right now? You tell any Jew back in the first century the temple is meaningless, you don't need it anymore, and we're like, you're in fruitcake. You're in nutcase. Well, I'm going go to go talk to Gentiles. Yeah, you go do that. Nutcase. The, the, the temples, you know. And plus, now, why, why would a Jew feel that way? Well, I don't know. We like, to, we like to believe God. We're weird like that. So when God says, my name will be there forever, my eyes and my heart will always be there. I mean, in fact, to this very day, it's why the, the Kotel, the, the Western Wall, is considered sacred. You say the stones are piled up there in, in boulders. Rebenson and I have been there. We've touched those stones many times. We've prayed at those stones. The, the ones the Romans knocked over are laying right there. And you can walk up to them and you can touch them and you can dive in. And guess what? The Ruach HaKodesh is still there. Because he said, I'll always be there. My heart will be there. He says, now look what, what Hashem continues to say to Solomon, though. We can't forget this. As for you, if you walk before me as David your father did and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne as I, as I covenanted with David your father when I said you shall never fail to have a man rule over Israel. So therefore, if the Mashiach ceases to follow the, 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 the Torah, then he ceases to be king. But if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I give you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I have given them, and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. He's talking about if you reject the Torah, then I'll reject it, you. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among the peoples, and though this temple is now so imposing and all who pass by will be appalled and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why he brought this disaster upon them. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the reason that we will be cast into exile is because we have forsaken the law of Moses. And all I ask you to do is think. Use logic. There's people that don't like what I teach. I would say they don't like me, but they don't know me, so how can they not like me? If they knew me, they'd think I was awesome. <laughs> so it's not personal. It's just that and listen, I have people, I, I, can I tell you how many people I've had and tell me, you just need to stop teaching, okay? Go get some education and stop teaching because you're really messing things up for me. And I will never stop. And every time you tell me to stop, I'm just going to do more. 
Every time you say stop teaching, I'm going to do 10 more videos that week. It reminds me of a short story. You ready for a short story? Yes, yes my wife says no, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> it reminds me of a, a, really, a really cute story that happened. I'll never forget this story. It's 100% true. And so I was in, uh, it's, a, it's a Marine Corps story, so sorry. So I was in basic training. I don't know if they still do this um, or not, but in basic training, part of the hand-to-hand combat time period you go through, they had this boxing thing. And so the deal was is that in the, the boxing ring was like a, a, a phone booth or like a, a, just a small space. You were very close to each other. I mean, just right there. And you're supposed to box it out, you're supposed to duke it out. You can't move around. There's nothing like that. It's just, you're just, it's just, it's just actually, it's Marine Corps sadistic, you know, thought. And so I had, fire, I had a fire watch with a buddy that, that afternoon, and we had been doing all this stuff. I mean, it's just, oh, my gosh, it's all this physical stuff, and this boxing thing was the thing, and we hadn't done it before, but it was going to be our turn after fire watch. It was going to be our turn. And so the, my buddy and I were about the same size, and um, he, he was tired. I was tired, and I said, hey, look, man, we had this plan. He's like, well, when we go out there, we're just going to kind of, you know, mess around. We're just going to kind of tap, 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 kind of put on a good show. But, man, I don't want to get beat up, and you don't. I'm tired. I don't want to hit the rack. I'm out. He's like, man, no problem. So we go out there, and, <clears throat> and this is just this is my fault because it's my personality. I'm pretty low-key in this kind of situation. So I go out there. And of course, there's two drill instructors, big old brute guys. They're on either side. Did y'all do this when, in your deal? Okay, well, this must be for enlisted people. So he's, they're both on one because they're mouth mistreatment. So they're on either side of us, and they're kind of looking down on this pit. We get in there. You can barely, barely move. It's right here, you know. And so we're just kind of going at it, you know. And at some point, he... I don't know what happened. I had my guard down. He kind of, he tapped me and it stung. I was like. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, at that point, you're just like, okay, that kind of stung a little bit. Like, mm, like that, you know, that, that hurt you. And he just hit me back. I'm like, oh, okay, like that, you know. And, uh, you know, boom, like, oh, give me like that, you know. And next thing you know, we're just going Tasman and devil on each other. And after it was all said and done, we're all bloodied and blistered. And those drill instructors said, oh, my God, that was the best fight all day long. I've never seen so much combat in my whole life. That was amazing. And we're like, man, what happened to you? Like, like you hit me, no, I hit you. <laughs> we're walking back to the base like, we do we have a plan or what? <laughs> so when you say to stop, I'm just going to keep going. So, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8. And we're going to wrap it up here because we're, we're out of time. Um, but again, I, I knew this would be a two or three part series here. But we're going to go to verse uh, 46. Now, I, 1 Kings chapter 8, I would encourage you to read all of 1 Kings chapter 8 because there's actually several times here where, has, where King Solomon is saying, hey, if we do this and we do that, we do this, we do that, and, and will you just hear our prayer? There's nothing about blood anywhere. It's just all about prayer, teshuva, prayer, teshuva, okay? But I want to focus on this one. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46 When they sin against you, this is King Solomon's prayer, when they sin against you, for there is no one who doesn't sin, right? This is a Jewish king recognizing that, no, we don't keep Torah perfectly. The idea that Jews think they have to keep Torah perfectly is ridiculous. The only person who doesn't say that is not Jewish. For there's no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over to the enemy who takes them captive to his own land far away or near. Now, pause right there and say, he's talking about exile. No temple, no sacrifices. Can't offer a sacrifice outside the temple. Strictly forbidden. Okay, so when we're in exile and there's no temple and there's no sacrifices, therefore there's no blood, how do we get forgiveness? King Solomon, verse 47. And if they have a change of heart in the land where they held, were held captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their conquerors and say, we have sinned, 
we have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive and pray to you towards this land you gave their fathers, towards the city you have chosen and the temple I built from your name, for your name, then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you, forgive all the offenses they committed against you and cause their conquerors to show them mercy for they are your people and your inheritance whom you brought out of Egypt, out of the iron smelting furnace. Nothing about blood. Can't be anything about blood. There's no, there's no temple to offer blood. It's all about teshuva, but that's because they're in the covenant. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. When we talk about Yeshua just forgiving our personal sin, it doesn't lead us to Mount Sinai. It leads us, frankly, to self-centeredness. Now, two final things. I'm going to read another one last scripture to prove this point. But I wanted to say this also because people don't always know. This is why people face towards the temple because of what I just read when we pray. Now, I had one time a, a, a Gentile, I was reading, uh, this has been a long, long time ago. There was a, a Gentile, like one of those kind of Hebrew roots type forms, and the people were saying, they were trying to suggest, because we Jews are always doing devious and evil and wicked idolatrous things, because that's just how we roll, that facing east was pagan. Facing east was pagan because we're facing the sun god or something like that. And I, I remember this has been a long time ago, and I chimed in. I said, hey, guys, we're not facing east. We're facing the temple. In America, it happens to be east. If you lived in Norway, you'd be facing south. If you live in South Africa, you're going to be facing north. If you lived in China, you will be facing west. It, doesn't, it, it depends on where you are on the globe, what direction you face, Right? Because it's all, in fact, in your, if you're in Jerusalem, you face the temple no matter where you are in Jerusalem. It's about facing the temple mount, okay? So I wanted to point that out. And one last thing, and we'll conclude with this, pick up next week with another part of this discussion, because there is a wonderful conversation to have with respect to the Midrash Rabbah about all of this, but unfortunately, we're out of time. But I wanted to say the book of Hosea, the book of Hosea, in chapter 3, I believe it's chapter 3, yes, chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, For the Israelites will live many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or idol. Afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling before the Lord and to his blessings in these last days. This is Hosea prophesying that we're going to be without a temple, not even without, without a king, without anything, without even priests. So how can we get forgiveness? He, Hosea answers us at the very last of the book. He says in chapter 14, verses 1 and 2 and, and 3, or one and two, excuse me. It says, return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. What is sin? Torahlessness. Take words with you. Blood, goats, bulls. No, words. I can't bring a bull, a, a bull or a goat. There's no temple. Take words with you. Say to him, forgive our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer our lips as if we offer the sacrifice of bulls. We need Yeshua to get into the covenant. But he didn't die for our sins. He died for our freedom. He died for our redemption. And now that we're in covenant, we can bring words with us. And God will hear our, our prayer and he will turn and he will consider every sin that we do in the covenant as if it, we just made a mistake. That's how God sees us. Thank you, Hashem. Todah for everything you've done for us. For Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Amen.